everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. I hope everything is working for you all on Zoom on your end. Well, hello, Wilma Jean. I haven't seen Wilma Jean in a while. That's Wilma Jean from Tallahassee, right? Is that you, Wilma? All right. Um, I see uh, Nancy Keska from Navarre. She, she from a Miami. local? Yeah. All right. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, we, uh, I am Mark Tanzig. I'm the horticulture agent here in Leon County. We have Rachel Mathis. Say, you want to say wave, Rachel? There's Rachel. Uh, program assistant here with horticulture program in Leon County. And our guest speaker, Mary Salinas, who will, you know, we'll introduce her a little bit more. We're going to talk butterflies today. Um, and so we're going to let some more folks as they come in. Uh, some, some housekeeping is that we will, um, yeah, first thing is we are recording today's um, presentation by Mary. We had a couple folks, uh, you know, this was a really, really popular one, Mary. Uh, uh, you like broke the Zoom internet capabilities in, in Leon extension over here. So, um, you know, we had a lot of people sign up. So uh, we had some folks that can't make it. So we are going to record. So if you don't want people seeing your face, you know, go ahead and turn the video off. That leads into the other housekeeping we do like to have during the presentation. Uh, if we can all turn our video off, our, our camera. And so if you look down at the lower left, there's a little video screen uh, or a little video camera and you can hit stop video and that'll uh, just kind of black out your screen. Um, if you have questions during today's presentation, what we're gonna ask you to do is put them in the chat box. So. Let's everyone practice chatting. I'm going to say hello. And hopefully you all can find your chat, your little toolbar at the bottom and where it says chat, you know, usually a little thingy comes up on the side uh, that lets you see all the chat. Okay, good. Wendy, Mary found it. Jean found it. All right. Everyone's finding it. Fantastic. So if you have questions as Mary is speaking, please write those into the chat. I'm going to be keeping up with them. Uh, and what we'll do is at the end, we'll come back and ask Mary to address uh, the questions that we got while she was speaking. Uh, again, this goes from uh, 10 to 12. And Mary, you know, she's got about, you know, close to an hour of presentation. Um, and we will then just kind of open it up to answer the questions that you all put in the chat and then answer, you know, whatever else comes to mind. So uh, I think with that, did I miss anything, Rachel? Housekeeping wise? All good? All right. So um, uh, our speaker is Mary Salinas. She is the residential horticulture extension agent in Santa Rosa County. She's been there for about seven, seven and a half years. And before that, she was also working with uh, IFAS down in Central Florida. So She's got a lot of experience and Mary absolutely loves butterflies. She's got some exciting news about the Santa Rosa County. Um, you know, they had a big, they, they had a big butterfly house that got moved, something or other happened. And Mary's been working really hard on getting that reopened at another location. And so things are moving on that. So I'll let Mary talk more about that. I think that's all. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Mary, and feel free to share your screen and then take it over. Okay, let me first share my screen. Okay, I see it on my end. Okay, you, um, you do see it? I see it, yeah. Okay, great. So good morning. I'm glad to see so many people interested in learning about designing a butterfly garden. Um, butterflies are such um, a cool part of our landscape, and it make it can they can kind of make our landscape kind of come alive because um, they're fluttering around and visiting the flowers and. And, and just creating some action in our, in our gardens. And um, 
And we're also being very environmentally responsible by um, creating a space for these, these um, delicate creatures. Oh, let's see. Um, this is, hmm, hold on a second. It is not letting me advance. Oh, there it goes. So for um, those of you who um, are not familiar with extension, um, I would like to introduce you to what extension is um, here at um, University of Florida IFAS. It's a partnership between the federal government, uh, the University of Florida, and each county government. And uh, each, each county has an office. Some offices only have one person in some really small counties, and some counties have, wow, like 20 people there um, and, and have a lot going on. So it depends on the, the population of the county and that partnership between um, the University of Florida and the, that individual county. So there's expertise in all kinds of areas, um, especially agriculture, that is where Extension started. Uh, also horticulture, where I am, uh, both uh, for commercial audiences and residential. Uh, 4-H, and everybody knows 4-H. That's, that's generally the, the place where people recognize Extension. Family and Consumer Sciences, um, C Grant, uh, because of course we have so many coastal communities, and um, more recently, Community Development and Sustainability. So today, what we're going to discuss is the needs of butterflies, um, how to design a garden um, to attract butterflies to come in, and then what to do to keep them in your landscape. Um, and then I'm going to talk about milkweed because, well, aside from the fact that I'm fascinated with uh, milkweed and, and, and I love it and I love to grow it, we get so many questions about, um, about growing milkweed and different milkweeds uh, for um, butterfly garden. And then we'll talk about good practices to follow in your garden. So um, this was part of my butterfly garden until Sally visited last Wednesday and stripped it pretty much clean. Um, took out all that good compost. It was just filled with Coreopsis and zinnias and daisies and uh, milkweed and <clears throat> roselle. Um, but, um, but it's gone now. And uh, I'll be looking at using the principles that I'm talking about today to rebuild that garden. Yeah, I, for, I forgot to mention that at the beginning, you know, we, uh, this is a rescheduled presentation and thank you so much, Mary, for, uh, you know, putting aside cleanup of your, you know, storm surge that got up into your place and uh, taking time to, to do this. So thanks again. And what a trooper. Go Extension. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Uh, we had 10 foot of water, um, a 10 foot surge come in and uh, fortunately we're, we're on stilts, our house is on stilts, so it just did, barely did not come into the living area, but it wiped everything else out. Um, on what? Mute, meaning they can't. So, um, so anyway, but you know, you clean up and, and you go on and be grateful for your blessings and what you're, what you're left with. So, um, but in Extension, we love this. We love sharing our passions. Um, and one of my passions is butterfly gardening and, um, and also caring for pollinators. So here I am, <laughs> ready to go. But I'll take off the rest of the week to continue with my cleanup. <laughs> so 
Um, what do butterflies need? They need a lot of the same things that any other creature needs. They need food and butterflies drink nectar primarily. Um, they need water. They need shelter. Um, they need a place to raise their babies. Um, so they need host plants uh, for their young. And they need sun and warmth. Um, that's why we don't see a whole lot of butterflies around in the winter. So when you're choosing a, a, a space in your garden, um, in your landscape, um, think about uh, an area that maybe uh, you can protect a little bit from, from the wind if you are in kind of a windy area. Um, and a place that's sunny because uh, butterflies do like warmth. And um, a lot of the plants that they depend on um, need to be grown in sun. Um, pick a place too that's accessible to irrigation uh, because you need to keep your plants in, in optimum health. And think about the existing plantings that you already have. Let's say in this picture, um, you have a, a nice uh, big tree uh, kind of in the background um, and some uh, kind of a tree line behind there. I'm not sure which way this faces, but if it faced west, it would kind of create a little protection from the wind. And then, you know, you have um, groupings around it. So you don't have to um, start from ground zero. You don't have to clear everything. Think about what you already have and how it can be integrated into the design. Um, for plant choices, um, you, you need those nectar plants for the uh, adult butterflies. And adult butterflies um, will feed on a wide assortment of plants. Um, but the host plants upon which those um, caterpillars feed, they are usually just a very narrow range. Um, and, and a prime example is monarchs and milkweed. Um, monarchs only feed on uh, the, the babies, the caterpillars, they only feed on milkweed. So you have to have that for them. Um, and let's say if you have citrus, um, that's a perfect host plant for the giant swallowtail. Um, and so that can be even part of your butterfly garden. And a lot of people don't think of um, citrus in a butterfly garden, but absolutely it can be. Um, so let's say you've had um, a, a really nice citrus tree uh, and we had cold come along and, and it killed off the top portion of it, the, the grafted portion of it, which was the so-called desirable portion. It was your uh, lemon or your lime or grapefruit or something and the rootstock grew back up. Um, and of course you wouldn't get good fruit from that rootstock, but that that citrus tree would make a good host plant for that giant swallowtail. So even though it's not going to provide you good fruit, you could leave that there um, as a host plant for the swallowtail. Um, and, and research what you have. Uh, oak trees, um, sweet bay, magnolia trees, a lot of these are host plants for um, butterflies and moths. So you want to choose um, plants that are primarily native, um, especially for host plants, although I just talked about citrus quite a bit, 
and citrus is not um, native here, but um, a, a lot of the uh, host plants are going to be native because those butterfly species co-evolved with uh, our native plants here. And so most of the, uh, the host plants are going to be native, but many will be Florida friendly. And especially when it comes to your plant choices for nectar plants. Different butterflies seem to be attracted to different colors. And so provide a variety of bloom color in your garden. It's not only going to make it more interesting and fun, but it will attract different butterflies. And look at providing a variety of flower shapes too. Um, many butterflies do like those open flat, um, flowers like that uh, Stokes Aster down there in the bottom right hand corner um, because it is easy for them to feed on but they also like some of the other shaped flowers so provide um, a variety of flower shape um, not all butterflies are the same they some have a very long proboscis for feeding and some have a shorter one and they all have their preferences. Um, also think about providing um, nectar plants throughout the year. Start with something that is going to bloom early in the spring, um, other things that bloom in the summer, other things that bloom in the fall, so that you always have some kind of uh, good blooms going on. You can also include things that will bloom all year or all season through the warm season, like sunflowers. And even though an individual sunflower is not going to, you know, last all year, if you plant them in rotation, um, and one year I did that with um, these sunflowers, then you will have them, you know, from spring uh, through fall. And, that, and that, that's, that's kind of fun. Uh, pentas is another one that will uh, bloom pretty much all, uh, all year, um, as long as it's warm. Um, one observation with pentas, and I learned this from uh, uh, somebody down at the um, Fairchild Tropical uh, Botanical Gardens in Miami uh, in their butterfly house is that the um, you need to use the original species of the pentas, the big pentas. A lot of the little dwarf pentas, uh, for some reason, when they bred those, they don't produce near as much nectar and they're not near as attractive to butterflies. So avoid the dwarf pentas, get the um, original ones, the, the large ones. Um, also include plants of different heights and shapes and textures. Um, some butterflies like to um, feed uh, lower, closer to the ground, and some maybe mid-level and some um, higher. Oh, and, and, um, and plant in, um, in layers um, so that you have those different levels so that uh, butterflies can um, feed at levels, you know, that they're accustomed to. Also, it provides them protection. Um, when storms come along, when it rains, when um, predators are around, they need a place to hide. So if it's all just um, little puffs of flowers, you know, of perennials or annuals, there, there's no place for them to tuck in. But 
in this landscape, there's uh, this picture showing uh, this landscape, there'd be places for them to hide in those trees and such. Also, keep in mind that um, a lot of other plants, not just perennials and annuals, um, are nectar plants. Um, a lot of trees that bloom in the spring, in the summer, in the fall, also will be good nectar plants. Uh, uh, in, in my landscape, um, I had some uh, beautiful Dahoon holly trees that bloom profusely in the early spring. And um, th they're tiny little flowers, but apparently great nectar because the bees and the, um, the early butterflies, especially the monarchs that uh, were returning from migration, were all over um, the holly tree, the Dahoon holly trees. So keep in mind that, that trees also can be, um, a, a, they are essential in a butterfly garden. So um, for um, the host plants, um, often they also are uh, nectar plants. Um, if this would, uh, I really like to do these kind of question and answer and get audience involvement, but I guess we can't really do it on here. I I, Doesn't I it like stink, to, Mary? I'm sorry. I can't wait to teach a, a class in person again. It'll I know, <laughs> I know, because I, I really like to ask a lot of questions and get involvement. Um, so. It, kind of throws me off a little bit, but but um, let's go back to my, one of my favorites, uh, milkweed. It's also a great nectar plant as well as a host plant. Um, and for host plants, you want to um, create groupings of them. If you just have one, um, you know, it will get eaten up. Um, quickly, um, maybe for some other reason it doesn't survive. Um, so create groupings of these, uh, of host plants for, um, for the little caterpillars. And I would suggest too that you don't put those plants um, in a real focal area um, because, you know, host plants are going to get eaten up. That's what we want the caterpillars to do. So try to um, tuck them in an area where they're not going to be so noticed um, or you know put some other plant there that is not going to get eaten up and um, you know provides a, a visual distraction. Um, I am going to talk about milkweed because I get we get so so many questions uh, about milkweed. Um, when we did a Gardening in the Panhandle Live program on, on uh, b butterfly and pollinator uh, plants, um, we had lots of questions on milkweed. So I'm just going to go ahead and address that. <laughs> um, it is, uh, it of course is the host plant for the caterpillars, uh, a good pollen and nectar, nectar source for many other um, uh, pollinators like uh, bees and wasps um, and uh, a lot of other insects also feed on the leaves and stem seeds um, especially aphids and milkweed bugs and I know people hate aphids they hate that aphids come and and get all over their milkweed plants but you know those aphids then are a food source for other um, beneficial insects that we do like, like our ladybugs and um, uh, other um, uh, beneficials like that. So, so they they do have their place, um, and a lot of the insects that do feed on milkweed sequester those. Uh, they feed on it because they can sequester those. Um, um, toxic compounds um, in their in their bodies 
um, as a defense uh, uh, against uh, predators. Um, the toxicity of milkweed, though, does vary greatly uh, among all those different species. Um, milkweed is important, too, because the uh, decline of the monarch population does decline, does correlate to the decline of milkweed um, in the environment. So, so much of the space that, that milkweed occupied uh, along fence rows, um, in natural areas, you know, have been taken over for farming or um, housing developments and such. And, you know, if, if there's not enough host plants, then there's, you know, for, for all of the caterpillars, then, you know, that population is naturally going to decline. But it's, it's easy for all of us to add a little bit to our garden and make a difference. If, if everybody does a little bit of something in their landscape to help out monarchs and other butterflies and our pollinators, it can make a huge difference because uh, a little bit here, a little bit there, it adds up. And we have so many millions of acres tied up in residential properties. So let's talk about some of the milkweeds. This is the one that most people are familiar with and is readily available in the um, in the stores, the tropical milkweed. Uh, it is really beautiful. It's tough. It's easy to grow. Um, and so if you are a grower and trying to produce quality plants to sell, you love this plant because it's easy and uh, and it grows really well. So you can't really blame the growers for that. Um, and I, I know there's a lot of controversy over whether you should grow it or not because it's not native. Um, it, it is not native, but it, uh, it is a, an important food source for our monarchs. Um, the one thing that we do want to do though, is cut it back late October into November to encourage the monarchs to uh, migrate and also to avoid a buildup um, of um, OE disease on the plants. If you cut them back and they regrow, that, that buildup of that disease, um, you know, is, is limited then. Um, and of course, if you cut it back uh, and let it regrow, you, you want to get rid of those cuttings or you can, um, you can sterilize them. You can, so if you want to make more plants from those cuttings, that, that would be fine. Um, you probably want to strip it of the leaves and, um, and soak it um, just briefly in a real weak bleach solution and that will take care of the OE disease and then you can, you know, make more plants. Now, when you're buying this at a lot of the box stores, um, a lot of times it, it, it looks beautiful. It looks perfect. Um, there's no aphids on it. It's not chewed up. Uh, it's, it's gorgeous. And, um, and we all love those gorgeous, perfect plants. Um, but, uh, I'm not sure now what they are treating the plants with at this point um, in the box stores to, um, to keep away the pests. Um, and I don't know if Mark knows, but uh, you know, at one point they were using a systemic uh, neonicotinoid to, um, uh, to um, you know, control pests on their plants. I understand they have stopped doing that, but I don't know what they are using. 
Um, yeah, but what I heard, Mary, is they were um, they were timing it better so that basically by the time we got to the store, you know, some of that stuff had, you know, the effectiveness of the insecticide had gone away. So they were timing it a little different. Um, but I do know that the, some of the stores, they also lose all their milkweeds as well because the monarchs find them. <laughs> and there's a local nursery that's always struggling because, you know, it's like, I can't sell them like this. You know, they're all, basically, they're all chewed up. <clears throat> well, little do they know, though, a lot of gardeners will buy them like that because they say, yeah. oh, if it's chewed up, it's got to be, you know, clean of pesticides. Um, so, um, but there's a lot of uh, local nurseries, uh, I know, in our area that, will grow it themselves and and they say they don't use pesticides um so let, let's talk though about some of the natives and um there's three that are um available i mean not widely but they are available so let's start with um butterfly weed um asclepius tuberosa um, it has really nice thin little leaves, um, these orange flowers, and it likes um, sandy soils. More, more sandy soils is pretty drought tolerant. Um, this is a picture of, uh, of my tuberosa that was taken on April 15th. So you can see that it comes out pretty early in the spring. And if you look closely, there's a little caterpillar on it. Um, and um, so the, uh, it, it is not, um, it is not the, the milkweed that the caterpillars like the best. Um, they, they they actually prefer some of the others, but they will use that. Um, one thing about uh, most milkweeds, and tuberosa is no exception, is it does not like to be moved. So if you uh, get some of that, um, be sure of where you want to plant it, um, because it really doesn't like to be moved, especially if, if it's, um, been there for, for a year or, or more. So this is a, a good one if you have more sandy soil um, and need something more drought tolerant. Um, the swamp milkweed or uh, Asclepius incarnata uh, likes to be wet. And I had a lot of this um, <clears throat> because I was real wet. It, um, likes sun. It also does not like to be moved uh, at all, but it is um, really big and beautiful. As you see on the slide, it gets to be about five foot tall. Sometimes you can find these at native nurseries. I'm not sure about your native nursery there in Leon County, um, if they carry it. <clears throat> Yeah, there's several of the uh, the local nurseries here will have the the natives and the tropicals as well. But there's a native nurseries is the you know a, a real popular one, and Tallahassee nurseries and um, they Espositos will typically have some native varieties as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think um, Seven Pines in Defuniac uh, has them um, as well. Um, I've been growing this one. Uh, quite extensively the last few years, the perennial or aquatic milkweed, Asclepius perennis. Um, it's, it's smaller, more diminutive, uh, only gets to be about two foot, but it has these lovely white blooms. It really likes to be wet. As a matter of fact, we have some in our demonstration garden in the pond, you know, just living in the water and it it loves it. <clears throat> I put it. Um, there. I couldn't uh, figure out where to plant it, so I just popped it in the pond, and it's just living. Yeah, yeah. It it loves to be wet. Um. So this um. Uh, this is a 
really important one too for monarch caterpillars in the in the wild. It has been deemed the second most important species of milkweed for monarchs in Florida. Um, the reason is because it comes out really uh, early in the spring. It is perennial. Um, if the, we have a mild winter, it will have leaves all winter. Um, and this photo was taken, um, you know, this year on April 15th. And it had come out like crazy. Uh, if you look closely, you can see it's been eaten up a lot. Um, and you can see some caterpillars on there. Um, so when those monarchs are returning from Mexico um, and they hit our shoreline, you know, come along the coast, <clears throat> they're looking to, um, to mate and lay their eggs. And so this comes out early and uh, is uh, a good nectar plant as well as a host plant uh, for, for monarchs. Um, one thing I do want to, um, uh, I should add about this, is propagating it. Um, you can propagate it from cuttings uh, like you would anything else. If you collect the seed pods, you want to wait until those seed pods uh, turn brown and they split open. And it has these nice little brown seeds inside probably 30 to 50 seeds, depending. And soak those seeds for at least a week in water. And don't worry if even it starts to get a little fuzzy in that water and you think, oh, these are gonna be ruined, they're gonna rot. No, they won't. They need to soak for at least a week and then um, put them in uh, a nice growing medium a little soil over top and let it stay real wet. And, um, and they will then pop right up. Uh, propagating the different milkweed species is different for, for all of them. They, they have different protocols. So uh, a lot of reason why people don't have luck with the perennis is because um, they may soak it for a day or not even soak it and it just, it doesn't do real well that way. This one, this species, uh, the sandhills of pinewood milkweed, uh, Humistrata, is not really available um, in, in the trade because it's difficult to grow um, and difficult to transplant. But what I wanted to uh, just say about it is this is the first one that emerges in the spring and is critical to returning monarchs. And this one is considered the most important uh, milkweed species for uh, returning monarchs in the spring. Um, it, it is all along um, the coastal Florida. Uh, it needs real deep sand. So it's all along those sand dunes and um, and available for, for those monarchs that come in. But they have a very long taproot. Even a tiny little seedling that's only maybe two inches tall is going to have a taproot that's a foot long. So it, you cannot transplant them. It just is not going to work. They do not like to be disturbed. So back to um, providing for uh, monarchs, I mean, butterflies in your garden, they do like a little bit of water. Uh, so if you can provide an area that maybe naturally puddles um, and is, is a little sandy and, and it puddles, that uh, is a magnet for them. They, they like to, um, drink that water and in the process lap up uh, you know, some minerals that are in that water. You can also uh, just make a, a shallow dish with rocks or sand and, and uh, I, I 
did have one that got washed away and it was really pretty hand painted by one of our former master gardeners and um it maybe it'll show up man. There. i'm sorry maybe it'll show up no <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's long gone but, um but uh you know something like that they they will they will use that in in your garden of course you want to make sure that you rinse it out right away you know very regularly because what else likes still standing water mosquitoes so uh if if you have something like that you you need to um flush out that water every day or so. So let's talk about predators. Um, there's, there's, a, um, there's quite a few things that also love butterflies. They like to eat them, whether they're adults or they're caterpillars. Um, and that's the way our world works. Um, uh, you know, we have this kind of cycle of life, you know, everything needs to eat. Um, we love our birds, we love our songbirds, but they also like butterflies and caterpillars. So, uh, according to the uh, Audubon Society, a clutch of chickadees will consume somewhere around, uh, if I remember correctly, three to 400 caterpillars during raising that clutch of, um, of, of chickadees, um, you know, they, they need to eat too. So, you know, d don't be too upset about some of your butterflies being food for, for other creatures. Uh, anoles uh, also love them, um, and they are a real problem, though, in uh, butterfly houses. Uh, if they can get into a butterfly house and, you know, start feeding on, on the, uh, the butterflies, that can be a real problem, um, because then there's no control for the uh, anoles. Uh, snakes also like them. And then um, a lot of what we call beneficial insects to control pests in our, our garden uh, also like butterflies and, and caterpillars. So we think of some insects as beneficial because they will control what we think is a pest, uh, something that bothers plants that we want. Um, but uh, they also will consume insects that you are trying to, you know, um, attract and, and, um, and grow in your garden. Uh, wasps, um, dragonflies, assassin bugs, uh, big eyed bugs, lady beetles, all kinds of um, things also, even though they will feed on things you don't like, like aphids and, um, um, boy, scale and what other kinds of bad things are in your garden. Um, they're also going to feed on your caterpillars. And that's, that's how, that's how nature though has evolved. If, if all of the eggs that that the um, butterflies laid in your garden made it to adulthood, they would be then overwhelming in their population. So it's, it's a balance of, of populations. So in your garden, you also want to add a comfortable place to sit and relax and enjoy your garden and enjoy those butterflies that are flittering around and making it such a, an enjoyable place. So let's talk about some good gardening practices 
to keep your uh, butterfly garden um, productive. You want to really look at um, keeping your plants healthy and you need to know your plants. So uh, uh, research uh, the, the plants that you're getting if you don't know what they need. Um, make sure they have adequate moisture. Uh, if they need a lot of moisture, group plants together that may need more moisture. Um, ones that are uh, that need to be drier, like um, Gallardia here, or uh, your Tuberosa, put those in a place that are going to stay drier. Uh, so you need to make make sure that they're they're healthy. Uh, mulch them, fertilize them if they need to, um, and deadhead them. Um, and that will help create more flowers. Um, you want to really avoid pesticides um, on your plants. And we get a lot of questions about aphids on milkweed and people wanting to get rid of the aphids. And I, I understand that they, they can really devastate your, your plants sometimes. But you want to first look for um, your caterpillars on those plants. Um, look for the eggs, learn to recognize what the eggs look like and the small little larva. Um, you know, if, if, they're, if you're sure that there's not any on there, then maybe you can, um, you know, do some kind of a treatment. You can squish them. Um, you can clip off some some uh, ends of le uh, ends of branches that um, are really highly infested. Uh, but also be looking for the beneficials. If there are any um, ladybugs there, if there's um, I didn't put a picture of them, but uh, surfid fly larva. Um, are generally found a lot uh, feeding on um, aphids. Um, but look to see what kind of controls you naturally may have going already. Uh, if you must though, um, use uh, an oil like a neem oil, a horticultural oil, or insecticidal soap. Um, but uh, for host plants, I really, I, I never do that. I just, I just let them go and let the, the beneficials kind of deal with the, the problem themselves. Um, you never want to use um, BT, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is um, a, uh, it comes in powder form or liquid form and it is a naturally occurring bacteria that infects um, uh, caterpillars. And we, we often do recommend it for, let's say, pests on your tomatoes or your squash or something like that, but you don't want to be using that in your, in your uh, butterfly garden. And you also don't want to use anything that's systemic that's going to be taken up through the roots and translocated throughout the plant into the leaves and possibly into the nectar. Um, there's a lot of ongoing research right now on the systemics and how they are translocated and whether they get into the nectar and the pollen um, and, and to what extent. And, uh, from what I've seen, a lot of plant species are different too in, in how they um, use those systemics and whether they end up in the uh, pollen and nectar. So you don't want to be using systemics. And now I get to tell you about a wonderful place that is up and coming if you are an avid butterfly person. 
Uh, for 21 years, the Panhandle Butterfly House was in Navarre, in Navarre Park. Um, and it was a tiny little place, kind of a postage stamp size compared to what it will be in the future. This uh, is the historic Jones House. It was built in 1880 and uh, uh, it is on this property. It's been restored to commercial standards and it will house um, uh, a room with a little bit of history about the house and the community and the butterfly house. We'll have uh, a, an exhibit room in there. Uh, there'll be a, a classroom, a shop, uh, and other facilities. And this sits on almost nine acres of land that the Butterfly House has. And hopefully by next year, we will have an 1800 square foot vivarium, which is of course the screened enclosure for live butterflies. And nature trails and a courtyard and beautiful gardens and hopefully by next year it will be open to the public. This is in Milton. So uh, if you are interested, uh, we have a very active Facebook page and you can keep track of what we're doing on, uh, on our Facebook page. So that's it. Um, Yay. And if we were, we had live, well, we could put it in the chat. Um, yeah, yeah. So, what, oh, what's the ahead. significance of the zebra long wing? Oh, yeah. What you got, folks? What do you know about the zebra long wing? Put it in the chat. Yes. Or you can unmute yourself for this part. Yeah, sure. Let's go crazy. <laughs> it's the Florida butterfly. Very good. Yep. Yep, our state butterfly and the na a native. And it absolutely loves firebush. Yes. It's a we seem to have a lot of them this year up north. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely a lot here in Tallahassee. There's been a lot in Tallahassee lately. Um, yes, I, I think with the warming, that it's gotten up into the panhandle much more. We have seen yeah. them much more in the past few years up here. Does anybody know the larval host plant of the zebra longwing? All right, testing the knowledge. Fashion vine. Fashion vine. Yeah. Fashion vine, yes, that's right. Or maypop. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's all over Elaine zinnias. So, some folks are saying that they love the Mexican sunflower as well. Uh, so we did get a couple questions come in and we can keep kind of taking them folks as you um, as you are thinking about things and kind of getting your you know your thoughts together uh, but first question because this is important about the butterfly house so where in Milton is it going to be Mary ah good question uh, 4966 Henry Street all right you get that uh, 4966, I'm going to put that in the chat, 4966 Henry Street. Yes, and it is within walking distance of the downtown, downtown uh, Milton. And if anybody is familiar with the West Florida Railway Museum, it's um, kind of just down and across the street, about a half a block. Wow, that, that's going to be, you're going to be a, a popular place, I think, Mary. Yes, I think That's so. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, Rachel's saying that if you can get a picture, uh, folks, if you know about iNaturalist, uh, the cool thing with iNaturalist is it's a citizen science type driven uh, app for your phone. It's free. And uh, get those sightings uh, logged in so that we scientists can see where these zebra longwings are moving all around. That'd be great. Uh, okay, a couple questions. Uh, you mentioned with pentas, that was really interesting, the dwarf pentas not being as useful for the butterflies. Um, do you know if there's any other 
uh, kind of like plants that we might think of. And, you know, sometimes I've gotten the questions about these cultivars or nativars, right? So is the, uh, you know, some sort of like cultivar of a native species, you know, are these not as beneficial? Should people look for the old fashioned native or the old fashioned, uh, you know, ornamental plant? Uh, any, any other plants that you know of, Mary, or just ideas on that? There's a lot of research that's being done on that right now. And I think uh, Gary Knox, uh, the horticulture professor there at the North Florida Research and Education Center, he and his graduate student are working on that. Um, so that is an area of, of, of a lot of interest right now because there are so many cultivars. And when they do the breeding, for um, bloom color or disease resistance or something else, um, how do they don't really know how that impacts the the nectar and the pollen and making it um, a suitable plant for uh, um, a nectar plant. <clears throat> so uh, that really is hard to say. Um, okay. there's just not a lot of good science out there on that. It's, it sounds similar to like some of our food crops where they've, you know, they've bred them for various <laughs> things, um, but they've lost some of the taste that has come with it. So it's just kind of like with the butterflies, right? They're, uh, mm -hmm. they're making these plants a little bit shinier, but they aren't so tasty to the butterflies anymore. Yeah. So uh, I would just observe, you know, if you, especially like with cone flowers, there are so many beautiful varieties of uh, cultivars of, of cone flowers out there. But are they attractive to butterflies? Now, some of them are. Um, I, I had some that, that were a, a cultivar, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, that the butterflies liked. But if you, if you, are concerned about that, you may want to stick to the tried and true um, old-fashioned species. I, I love the Traditional comment species. of just observe. So that's a, you know, yes. just sit out in the garden and watch and see what happens. It's good yeah. for you. Yes. Uh, Rachel just put some links in the chat. So there's some really good uh, University of Florida IFAS extension links. Uh, and we will be sending out, um, Mary, as long as you send us the, if you send us the presentation, we'll make a PDF and we'll send it out to all the group. Um, sure. along with these resources here, but uh, uh, there's some really good links in the chat there. The Butterfly Gardening in Florida, that's a pretty long uh, publication with all these tables in the back uh, with specific information on the various families and groups of butterflies and their host plants and their nectar plants and when they're around, and it's, it's pretty great. Uh, and the bottom one there where it says pollinator course, uh, there is a, a kind of a Kind of a class you can take through this canvas software online and with i think rachel mallinger put that together and she's kind of the uh, uh she's kind of like pollinator ecosystem service um, graduate student i believe uh, is that right mary i think she's a graduate student am i, am I right there um, i i think she's an assistant professor oh okay so in my bad she's a professor now over there with, with gainesville so uh, maybe we just promoted her, but hey, uh, she's got some really good information. Um, and, and she is, she is awesome. We yeah. we've uh, we've had her at conferences before, and uh, she she's really good. She really knows her stuff. I also oh. just put in the chat um, our Quizlets. So we have all these Quizlets, and one of them specifically for today is the Butterflies of Florida. Um, and I've chosen just some of them that are you know sort of hyper local, the ones that are particularly in the panhandle. Um, so you, you can learn about their, uh, what their caterpillar looks like, what the butterfly looks like, and then what their larval host plant is. That's awesome. Awesome. Uh, okay, question. You kind of brought this up, Mary, uh, mm -hmm. you, when you talked about all of the, you know, the other critters and the circle of life. And I always think of the Lion King introduction, <laughs> you know, and the song. Uh, but um, what do you think about birds near the butterfly garden? So should someone 
should there be a, if there's a bird feeder, should it be like really far away? Should you not try to have birds and butterflies in the same space? What do you do? Well, if you've ever observed birds, I mean, they're, they're everywhere in your landscape. So um, just because your bird feeder or your bird bath or something is close to your butterfly garden isn't really going to make a difference, I, I don't think, uh, because those birds are, are traveling so far and so fast. I don't think it makes a difference. Okay. Um, the circle of life, right? The birds got to eat too. Yes, the bird, and we love our songbirds, and, and, and that's a whole nother discussion about the decline of our songbirds because of loss of habitat and, and, and law, you know, lack of food. Yeah, so. speaking of that, I'm going to, uh, Doug Ptolemy, uh, who's kind of a, he's a professor, oh, I forget which university up there in the near Chesapeake Bay area. Yeah, he is, uh, he's great. And he talks a lot about what we all can do for uh, songbirds, you know, all sorts of wildlife. And there's actually a great website that I'm sticking in the link in the chat there. Uh, and that's kind of all about his, you know, it's got links to, you know, he's written several books. Uh, but the great thing about Doug Ptolemy is that he is, uh, you know, research based. So at Extension, we love it when we can find uh you know, some sort of like famous expert that's also, um, you know, everything's uh, kind of uh, rooted in, in research. So uh, he's done some amazing work and he's got some information at that Bringing Nature Home website to, to help folks, uh, you know, make things better for all the critters out there. Um, you talked about native and non-native milkweeds. The question came up, you know, which one do I plant? And I think, you know, you went over it well, but would you say, you know, uh, should the non-native tropical milkweed be like, you know, not on the list or it, can it be on the list with a little caveat or something? What, what, what would you tell folks? I, I would tell people it, it, it's fine to have in your landscape. Um, it, you know, it serves a purpose, but uh, I would, I would cut it back in October, November, late October, November, um, you know, for those same reasons, to encourage the monarchs to um, migrate uh, so they don't, you know, stay here all winter and, you know, or stay here too long and then they're laying eggs and, you know, on your milkweed and then the frost comes and kills them all. So, um, you know, we need to encourage them to, to migrate uh, and also to prevent the buildup of that OE disease um, on the right. plant tissue. And, and I think, um, you know, gardeners oftentimes when the monarchs are really munching up all their plants, you know, they want to go to the nursery and they want to buy more. And oftentimes that tropical milkweed is going to be the, the kind of the only selection left. And you talked about it as well, like that one is very easy to grow. And you talked about how tricky some of the natives are to grow. And there's, you know, the reason there's only so many natives available is that whole taproot issue, right? So they don't do well in containers. They don't do well transplanting. So there's few native options usually available. There's a bunch of tropical milkweed because it propagates really easily and does well in containers. And so it's perfect for the, like the greenhouse and nursery business and industry. Uh, so it's okay, I think, to have those tropical milkweeds just yet. Yeah, remember to, you know, by Thanksgiving before you, well, before I was going to say before you like get together with all of your family, it might be a little different in COVID. I know I'm not going to be able to see some of my family. Anyway, uh, before Thanksgiving dinner, go out there and, and cut those tropical milkweeds down. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that's the best. Um, if you have a wet area, the the perennis is is a great one to grow because that that one um, seems at, at least for me is about the easiest to propagate but the uh, incarnata and the humistrata you know it, um, are pretty good as well uh, so when you have your milkweeds getting eaten up right so uh, the mil the monarchs are tearing them all up should they go buy more? Should they just leave it alone? 
what's your recommendation? Should they run out and try to buy up all the milkweeds they can find or just kind of let it be? Well, sure. If, if you want to add more to your garden, that's, that's, that's fine. That's good. Um, just keep in mind that the more milkweed you have, the more eggs you'll have, the more caterpillars you'll have. And it's some, you're, you're almost always going to be overwhelmed with, <laughs> with them. It's like chasing the um, tail. Yeah. But I know in, in my landscape, they, uh, the the predators are are all over i have i'm a haven for assassin bugs um they are just all over everything and all over the milkweed and so i know i lose a lot of caterpillars to them but they also eat the aphids too so uh we had a question uh you were talking about cutting back the tropical milkweed is there a need to cut back the giant milkweed? So the giant milkweed for you folks uh, may be going, what is giant milkweed? Uh, this is the, I believe it's Calotropis and it's a real big, I, mean, I know I planted this one for my mom a long time ago down south and it's still big and huge and it's kind of got like a silvery color leaf and those big old purple flowers. Uh, is there a need to cut back those giant milkweeds as well, Mary? You know, I'm not a hundred percent, but I would think that that yes, that that um, you know, it, it's the same logic as cutting back the um, tropical. Yes. And those I know will, uh, you know, you can prune them back pretty hard, and they'll come back, kind of like those yes. tropical milkweeds. Yeah. Yeah. Any of the milkweed are they're really tough. You can cut them down to the ground, and they come back. Because they're used to that, they're adapted to that. And we had a question, uh, you know, firebush is really popular, uh, especially for butterflies. Is there a need to cut that one back? And if so, when would you do that? No, there's no particular need to cut it back. Uh, I know in my landscape though, it dies down in the winter. Um, even if we don't get a hard freeze, it, it dies back. But comes back from the roots um, or so you don't need to cut it back if it doesn't die back though. Yeah, typically, uh, you know, we have a bunch here and it does uh, die back. I think this winter it might not have, but this past winter, but um, usually what we do is we wait till we know, you know, cause usually it's a bunch of dead sticks, you know, from the old branches that are frozen back. And we typically wait till kind of the last frost is done and then we kind of take all that stuff off and let it kind of flush back up uh, looking new. Um, uh, down south where I, I grew up in West Palm Beach, the firebush uh, is a perennial. It doesn't die back and it actually becomes a pretty large tree, uh, yeah. tree slash shrub. Um, uh, oh, let's see. Um, uh, Mary, will you, if you unshare your screen, I guess we can see everyone. So we got a, a request that we can unshare, then we can see all of our, and we can put our, our, our video cameras on now and we can actually see everyone. Okay. Uh, remember, uh, a reminder that we are recording, so uh, your, your image will be saved forever. Uh, hi, Ashley. Ashley's eating a cookie. That looks pretty good. <laughs> um, um, let's see. I was going to ask next. Oh, so in your little, little water thingy, uh, your puddler for your bird, for your butterflies, uh, mosquitoes came up and you did mention to flush those, that water. Um, and it's typically every five days is when you want to do that. Cause, uh, that's, you know, their cycles about five days, five to seven days. But I did want to mention, and someone brought it up, those, the BTI, the mosquito bits, so Mary mentioned BT in the garden for caterpillar control is harmful, uh, but there is a product that is BTI. So it's a little bit of a different strain of BT and that one is safe for your birds and your butterflies. So that one can be used. And um, uh, Mary, talk about that because I actually have a, a package that was given to me by the local mosquito control and I'm going to show them what it looks like, but it's a really good product that doesn't harm, you know, most, it only goes after flies and midges, black flies and mosquitoes. So one second, let me show you the package. 
And these are these are little little bits. You can see it now. You know, there's several uh, brands, so I'm not uh, specifically promoting this one brand here, but these this is called Mosquito Bits, and you just kind of take almost just a a little teaspoon and kind of put it in the, the container, and it's usually good for at least a week. Um, and of course, there's directions on there on how to use it, but that's a real safe one. Uh, and it will leave the uh, the butterflies, the frogs, the lizards, the birds. Uh, it, it's it'll all be safe. Yeah, you can even use it in your bird bath or like in your bromeliads. You know where it holds a little bit of water. Um, yeah. And they come in big, like they look like donuts as well. Mm. You know, for bigger spaces. You know, like ponds and such. Rain barrels, something like that. Rain barrels. Um, okay, here's a here's a little bit of a trickier one. And folks, if y'all got questions, uh, please uh, either chat, uh, type them in, or we can open it up in a little bit, and you can just ask away. Uh, but we got the question to name some beneficial nectar and or host plants that do well in part shade. So get your thinking cap on. And we uh, some folks did mention some in there. Uh, but what you got, Mary? Beneficial uh, nectar and host plants for butterflies that do well in part shade. Well, for part shade, um, a good nectar plant is Stokes Aster. Uh, they, they love Stokes Aster. Um, uh, let's see, what else would be a good nectar plant? Um, in part shade. Um, pretty, I mean, anything that's going to bloom in part shade, um, the, the milkweeds will do okay in part shade. Um, uh, what about, is columbine a good nectar plant? That does well in part shade. Yeah, that was one I was going to mention. It, uh, it does. I, I, I've never really seen much of anything on my columbine. Mm -hmm. Um, but it does like part shade. Uh, some other ones that came in is so like Monarda, uh, the bee balm, you know, that can it's handle some shade. Nice. It'll be a little leggy maybe, but they, they definitely love that one. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I grow uh, Brichelia cordifolia, which is flurs or flyers. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Nemesis uh, in part shade. And it does very well. It is, it gets about five feet tall. But the monarchs love that right about now. It's blooming. That's a brachelia, right? Mm -hmm. Cordifolia. I'm going to put that in the chat, folks. Y'all can cordifolia. Also, um, a, a great resource for um, native wildflowers is the Florida Wildflower Foundation. And they have a fabulous site. Um, and, and link to the um, Wildflower Growers Cooperative that sells uh, native Florida wildflower seed. Um, you know, if you order, um, you know, wildflower seed or even perennial seed or whatever from a place in Nebraska, it may not be adapted well to living in Florida. So even if it's a species that does live in Florida. So, um, you know, if you try to uh, access um, seeds or plants locally, that's always the best. And some more uh, part shade loving, uh, part shade plants that the butterflies will enjoy. We got uh, native salvia came in as uh, doing pretty, handling the, handling the part shade pretty well. And then that butterfly guide, so the resource that we'll send you, and Rachel just put that Florida Wildflowers link in the chat, but the, the, the resource we'll send you from University of Florida, it's got that long list and tables in the back. And I just kind of breezed through there and found some, um, so like Arundinaria, which I've never seen, some of these are kind of wild plants that might come up by themselves. I don't know if I've ever seen Arundinaria for sale at a nursery, that's a native bamboo, um, relative, big grass. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, that won't handle deep shade. Hackberry is another one. So um, hackberry or sugarberry, that's celtus, is a tree. Um, and that comes up kind of like a weed in my backyard, actually. 
uh, we mentioned columbine, stokes, monarda, uh, casmanthium, so wood oats, which is a grass that can handle shade and that can be uh, an important uh, one according to the, the UF document there. And our favorite, don't forget Biden's alba, you know, <laughs> Biden's alba, Spanish needles, you know, we're usually cursing it, but the pollinators absolutely love it. And so uh, it can definitely handle some partial shade, I would say. Um, and so as that's for, uh, I'm sorry, as for a host plant, um, passion vine also can grow in a lot of shade. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, for nectar, I was thinking too, some of our palmettos can handle a bit of shade. Um, and they have these really beautiful, you, you kind of don't even think of palmettos as flowering, but they send out these long flower spikes. Um, and yeah, the bees, I know the bees are usually all over them. Mm -hmm. uh, some other ones that came, fire spike was mentioned. That's a really good one for the shade. Uh, you get hummingbirds off of that one as well. Uh, our favorite over here, our turkey tangle fog fruit, or one of our favorites, that's a ground cover. Uh, that's phyla. I'll put, that, that's, a, that's a fun name. I just want to spell it out for you. Turkey tangle fog fruit. Whew. Uh, that's a ground cover. If you're in Tallahassee, uh, you can come get some from us because uh, it is spreading. It's, it's a aggressive ground cover and kind of um, you need some room for it or you need to be able to, to stand its... Uh, um, it's spread and so we have quite a bit and it roots really easily so I can just kind of quickly pull some out off the sidewalk and it can be yours so uh, you can come help us weed <clears throat> right Clara all right I think I'm sorry my husband was getting ice and I didn't hear what you said <laughs> uh, I was I was donating some of the turkey tangle fog fruit from bed four at the extension office I want to uh, sorry <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I want to do a quick plug. Brought the my little um, edger, my weed eater, and I edged over by there, and I brought some home. So <laughs> I started a collection, a little area of the same thing. Oh, good. I want to good. try. Yeah, there's there's plenty to go around. I want to do a quick uh, little plug for our demonstration gardens, and I'm sure you guys have went over there too in Santa Rosa, where if you're looking for um, if you have any kind of landscape, I know in Leon County, we have all sorts of um, different, different sort of little ecosystems or little uh, versions of yards. So we have like a really shady area. We've got a full pollinator garden. We've got a big tropical garden. And so you can kind of see what would go well um, at your house. So definitely, you know, they're open. Ours is open 365 days a year. Uh, you know, day, all daylight hours, and you can just take a nice walk through a little garden there. And Karen's asking about uh, turkey tangle fog fruit seed in Jacksonville area. So I don't know if any, I've never uh, known anyone to start it from seed. Uh, usually you're going to get, uh, you know, uh, vegetative parts to start it uh, or buy it in a container. Um, but I would think, uh, I don't know, does Jacksonville have a good native plant nursery? Uh, I don't actually know. Um, but you could contact your extension office over there and talk to Chris Kerr. He's your, uh, I guess he's the commercial horticulture, horticulture agent over there right now. But um, you know, maybe you're gonna have to drive on over to Tallahassee, Karen, and, and pick yourself up some, mm -hmm. some uh, turkey tangle fog fruit. There's, there's some, um, I'm not sure how close any of these are Hawthorne's by Gainesville, but I posted uh, the fan, um, you know, search, search terms for phyla, not a flora. Yeah, and fan is the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. That's a website you can kind of put dial in a plant name, and it'll give you a list of nurseries in Florida that uh, have that available. Uh, so and we got any questions for Mary that you've been thinking of, uh, as you've been sitting here, uh, uh watching ashley eat that amazing looking cookie <laughs> she is adorable <laughs> yeah uh, i don't think her name's ashley because or she can't hear us because uh, uh she it doesn't seem to make her ears perk up at all uh you, if you guys got a if you guys got a question you can unmute yourself and ask away mary when did you say the uh uh your wildflower, or not wildflower, your butterfly garden is going to open again in Milton? We look to be operational 
uh, by next summer, if all goes well. Um, we are, uh, if any of you are familiar with uh, Impact 100 um, groups, uh, there's an Impact 100 uh, Pensacola that is, um, that offers grants every year. And, and the Butterfly House is a finalist for uh, a grant for $106,000. Um, and that will make that vivarium possible. Um, we'll know about that on October 11th when, when the winners are announced. Uh, if, if we don't get that, have no idea when we'll be open because uh, it, it'll cost about $134,000 to construct that vivarium because it has to, you know, have concrete footers. It has to have specialized, uh, be a specialized structure um, and it has to withstand wind. <laughs> so uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be up um, by next summer just keep following the butterfly house on facebook awesome thanks mary and we have um at least one person here who's several people on this who have been volunteers there at the butterfly house uh donna barker and nancy casca awesome and so, it's called the vivarium that's the official name for a butterfly house uh, yes, uh, vivarium is a term that um, is a specialized screened enclosure for wildlife. So it could be any kind of wildlife, but of course ours are butterflies. I have a question regarding um, butterfly gardens. Are small pocket butterfly gardens throughout your yard just as effective as one giant one? Um, it, it, it depends on what you mean about little pockets. I mean, you need to have enough so that it's noticeable. Um, but yes, I, I would say yes. Um, I'm, and, and the bigger, the better. Um, but even, um, several pots of, um, uh, of plants on a patio, Make, can make a difference and you'll see butterflies, you know, coming to those and other I, colonies. Now I was thinking like five or six areas, maybe eight that are approximately 50 square feet each. That would be. Oh, absolutely. Now, okay. Oh my gosh. Yes. That, that'd be wonderful. That, that and, would and be Mar good. Mary, that's our own uh, Jean Breland, our, our milkweed aficionado over here, a Leon County Master Gardener volunteer. And she has her own vivarium, actually, and uh, wow. raises quite a few. Well, her, her husband had to put it together. She, she raises all the milkweeds that we sell during our plant sales when, you know, we're allowed to have them. And she oh, has had to get quite, um, she's had to get quite. Can you uh, show in, them my let's see, quite uh, creative with ways to keep the butterflies from eating all of her plants before it's plant sale day. <laughs> and she's done wow. really, she's done That's some, awesome. uh, she, she talks to um, our new Master Garden volunteers about the whole propagation process because she's, she's really figured it out, Jean. I don't know if you want to share, uh, you know, Mary spoke about the aquatic milkweed and some tips for getting those started. And she did mention, you know, they're all a little bit different. So Jean, uh, you want to share with us some um, starting milkweed from seed knowledge? Oh, I didn't know they were different. So I treat them all the same. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I take the dry seeds. Like this year, I had a really big harvest of perenna seeds, but I have never gotten any other seed. Well, I did get some tuberosa seed pods. I've never gotten any incarnata seed pods. So I have to order those from an area person. But I typically um, stratify them for six weeks in a refrigerator in a damp paper towel and then pop them out. I start early, like early January. So they're nice size. Um, I, well, I peaked too early last year. So a lot of them were ready way before the plant sale, which is fine because there was no plant sale. But um, yeah, so this year it should be better. I'm going to control my desire to grow a thousand and just stick to like 500 <laughs> but um yeah i just treat them all the same and everyone gets the same amount of water although now that i realize 
tuberosa will survive with less water, it's gonna be moved to the other side of my little screen house. So um, yeah, so that's, I just start them in the greenhouse early under grow lights and then move them out as soon as they can. You know, probably before I should, but anyway, so. And uh, I will, get, I will, I've got some that I will give away if anyone needs any more. Oh, uh, Mary, Mary just asked, do we have any to sell? Uh, just uh, tr uh, Mary, I think Mary, uh, Mary in the master gardener, the new master gardener training class, right, Mary? Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll hook you up with Jean's contact information. Yeah. I I, just, I, curbside. <laughs> yeah. We got to be all COVID safe and everything. Um, I think Ash, Ashley, I think you wanted to share something with us. Can you hear me, Ashley? Here, I'm going to try to unmute you, Ashley. Are you, you got it? Hey, Ashley. Hi. Hi. Did you know we got a bunch of old caterpillars were not the, the some of old caterpillars in the next day, they weren't here, but now this is our first one that was still here outside. That is made it, a little thing. Is it in a, is it in a chrysalis yet or is it a caterpillar? Is it still a caterpillar? No. Caterpillar. Is it, is it caterpillar. The caterpillar. So, okay. Just, it loves our milkweed. And then we've covered it um, with something, maybe hoping that it would stay in there or make a chrysalis. We're keeping an eye on it. We're just hoping cool. we can kind of see the process. Yeah, I, she, she, I see that she's keeping a close eye on it. That's a great job. <laughs> yeah, she's, she is. Thank you for letting her share that. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks. Uh, we got. And this a, is my little sister. <laughs> Hi, little sister. Hi. Let them get back to their thing, okay? Bye. Bye. Nice talking with you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> well, and it's great to get the little ones involved. Um, you know, butterflies are a great gateway species to get kids involved in science. Um, you know, hands-on involvement is always the best. And yeah, you can see she's really excited about that. You know, at the very beginning, you mentioned butterflies bring life to the garden and, uh, you know, it's got Ashley uh, sucked in. So that's awesome. That's been the best little uh, uh, chat we've had on Zoom, I think, so far. Um, uh, any other questions? Anyone want to unmute themselves and ask away? We got 30 minutes, so you know it, you can come bring butterfly gardening questions, uh, any old landscape question. We'll just take them as they come. I have Mexican butterfly, and then I also have native butterfly. And this last year, I tried to transfer a caterpillar from the Mexican to the native, and it was not interested at all. I don't know. Why that might be? Uh, on a on a milkweed. Yes. The milkweeds. Yes, yeah. Yes. Um, and um, I have uh, I have tried that too as kind of an experiment, um, but I've also read some up about that. That um, once once that caterpillar starts feeding on a particular species of milkweed. It really does not like to transition to another species of milkweed um, because they do have uh, a different taste and a different toxicity. So they all are a little bit different. We have quite a few native in our yard, native milkweeds, a couple different varieties, but I've never seen a caterpillar on any of them. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that is. I mean, they're only on the milk, uh, Mexican. Okay. Um, yeah, that is interesting. I mean, I do know, like Mary said, the, the toxicity is different. And I wonder if the tropicals got a little bit less that makes it a little more uh, appetizing for them. Uh, it's a really cool story with the, the monarchs, the milkweeds, and these toxic compounds um, that we could almost kind of almost have to have a whole chat about it. But it's like a... Um, you know, the milkweeds are trying to come up with new kind of compounds to fight off the, the, the butterfly or the caterpillars from eating them. Uh, and then the caterpillars find some new way around this compound. 
And the cool thing with monarchs is that they take this toxic compound and while they're eating it as a caterpillar, it stays in their body as they're an adult. So that when the birds go to eat monarchs, they get this bad taste in their mouth. Um, <laughs> and so they learn not to eat them. And there's then other butterflies that are not toxic, right? So the ones that are confusing with the monarchs, right? Is the is it the queen and the the viceroy? Is that the two that you often confuse? Uh, those two little tricky things are just looking like the monarch because they somehow have figured out that the birds know not to eat the monarchs, and so they want to look like the monarchs to trick them into not eating them as well. Although they don't, you know, they taste good to the birds. So it's really a cool story, and you know. Maybe it's the whole toxic thing, Donna, that's making those monarchs. They'd rather eat the, the less toxic one. Uh, we did get some good questions that came in. Um, the best time to plant a butterfly garden. So um, now, uh, now, yeah. well, you know, it just, it depends on what you're planting. If you're planting trees um, as a, like a base for your garden, then you want to plant those in the in the winter, um, you know, January, February, March, uh, you know, when it's cooler. So it depends on the individual plants. Yeah, and the with containerized plants, and we get this question a lot. I mean, really, those can be planted throughout the year. It just depends on how much you're going to have to maybe uh, you know baby them a little uh, through stress of like the, say the the middle of summer or something like that. But um, you know, uh, Ashley, whenever you're ready with your plants, uh, go right ahead. Um, a good question, lantanas. Uh, are they native and are they good for butterflies? This one, uh, I'll let you handle it first, Mary. Uh, yeah, I do have some experience with lantanas. I worked for uh, a professor that was breeding them um, uh, at the Gulf Coast Research and Education Center for sterility, trying to come up with sterile cultivars. Um, uh, Florida does have some native lantanas. Um, they're, they're not as um, pretty in the landscape as the lantana camara that is, um, is not native. Um, and that's generally what you're gonna find in the, in the nurseries and the box stores is the lantana camara. Um, the old species of those do go to seed. They, they make these um, uh, purple uh, seeds and uh, they are invasive. Um, it's actually one of the 10 worst weeds uh, in the world. Um, and, and they're not only weedy, but they're very hazardous and poisonous to livestock. Um, so if, if you have horses or cows or something, you hate lantana. <laughs> you want to eradicate that. Um, there are some now sterile cultivars, um, and I would recommend those. Um, I would not recommend any of the old varieties that set seed. So if you have any <clears throat> that do set that purple seed, um, you know, here at UF IFAS, we recommend that you get rid of those and um, plant the sterile ones. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I'm actually otherwise, gonna... yeah, butterflies love them. They have, yeah. <laughs> it's, and it seems that all the, all the cultivars make, uh, great um, nectar and pollen, so. I'm putting a link to the IFAS assessment in the chat here. And it's great because you can just start typing in Lantana. They'll have all the uh, various cultivars and they'll let you know which ones are sterile. Um, uh, so let me get this put in the, it will let you know which are safe to plant. So I have a question. I'm working on uh, an article now and I can kind of pull everybody but ask Mary too as well. Um, what, uh, what kind of problems or if you've had problems with fire ants in your butterfly garden? And then what do you do? That me? 
Yeah, what do you do? Well, I, I know that we recommend baits for fire ants. Um, and I don't know that they would be hazardous to butterflies because they're not going to be contacting the, the baits. Um, you know, you can discourage them with just boiling water, you know, and maybe move them until they go to your neighbor's yard or something. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so if you don't want to use any kind of pesticides, you can do the boiling water routine, but it's not going to totally kill them. Um, yeah, I just put I just put a link in the chat. Uh, there's a great website, and I don't know if you've seen this, Mary. I just kind of found it not too long ago. It seems like it was a newer site uh, put up on uh, by the the mothership in Gainesville, uh, mm. but it's sustainable fire ant control, and it kind of goes over all of the kind of the options you have for taking care of them. Um, oh no, I've never seen that. Yeah, one thing, you know, there is some folks that do like broadcast treatments, um, and some of those. Uh, products that they use in those broadcast treatments are kind of these broad spectrum uh, insecticides that could harm. I mean, again, usually it's in the soil, so um, maybe not as harmful on on butterflies um, because you know most caterpillars aren't hanging out there. But you know who knows. Um, uh, but there's a lot of good information on there and how you can um, best kind of treat them without. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of harming other other critters now it does also let you know that the whole grits thing um, you know that doesn't work um, it does mention the hot the boiling water and it does mention the there's a trick where apparently you can take the ants from one mound and throw them on another and they kind of have like a battle royale um, you know I don't want you guys to get bit at playing out there playing with fire ant mounds though so or stung I guess so um, be careful. But I think those like the baited products, uh, I know Amdro's kind of, I think the most common uh, brand name product, um, like Mary said, they're, they're baited. So they're mostly just bringing in ants. The ants take those little baits down to the queen. And um, you know, that's kind of, uh, that's what I've always used um, when I'm messing around with ants. Now for your vegetable garden, um, their Amdro is not labeled for use in a vegetable garden. So okay. there, uh, there's a product called Come and Get It, uh, which is spinosad. And that's a, a, a natural, a more natural product that is labeled for use in vegetable gardens. <clears throat> spinosad, yeah, spinos spinosad. <clears throat> Rachel just spelled it out for you there. Yeah, I've had, so I have a big, beautiful passion vine and I planted it on, you know, a small, maybe five, six foot section of my fence. And I was looking all summer for my caterpillars because, you know, it's passion vine. It's supposed to be a nice larval host plant. I was looking for my gulf fritillaries and I couldn't see them, but there were ants all over the, the, um, plant and I realized with some research they're eating the caterpillars too because they're omnivores they'll eat they'll eat the nectar from the plant and they'll eat the caterpillars or the or the eggs so it's kind of an arms race I'll treat for ants and then the plant will go down a lot and then the ants will come back a little bit and and the caterpillars will go away so the, the plant gets even taller <laughs> <laughs> Fire ants. It's part of being a Floridian. Uh, there was a, a woman I met that came from Canada and she was vegetable gardening with me. And uh, she's like, I don't know how you Floridians deal with this. You got the heat, you got mosquitoes and you have, you know, these intense fire ants. She, she had never had a fire ants on her and like, oh man, this is, you know, this is just part of being a Floridian. I have a question regarding the attractant that milkweed has for the butterfly, as well as, is it just hit or miss that when a caterpillar, I've seen caterpillars walking across my grass from one milkweed plot to another. Is it just, they're just blindly going out there thinking they might run into something? But how does the butterfly find the milkweed to begin with, I guess? Deep is, question. Thank are you. there pheromones? Well, butterflies, um, they, they taste, 
the plants with their feet. And that's how they, they recognize the plants um, from, from what I understand. Um, <clears throat> now, if there's, if there's a large number of caterpillars on a particular plant or group of plants, they will, they will migrate looking for more um, milkweed. And I think it's kind of hit or miss because I have seen that happen in my own yard and they're heading towards areas where there is no milkweed. So they're just kind of blindly <laughs> saying, well, you know what, there's not enough food here, so I may as well go look for more. And I guess the idea is that the, the adult caterpillar will lay the eggs in a spot where as those eggs hatch, right, that they're set up in a good spot to, to feed. Um, but I guess if they start running out, they, they, they go looking for more resources and maybe it is hit or miss, Jean. I just direct them to my trap milkweed, which is the tropical. When in doubt, just move them to the trap milkweed. It like, uh, it's like rose petals all in the yard where you have pieces of the tropical milkweed leaves on the, like breadcrumbs. I just pick them up and move them. You know? okay. We just go for a joy ride. <laughs> <laughs> so Mark? Yeah, there was there's an um, a while back. It looks like it was March of 2008. There was an article uh, in the New Scientist. I don't know how valid that is, but it said that butterflies remember caterpillar experiences. Wait a so, second. Wait yes, a second. My, kids, my kids are going to blame you for the rest of your life. <laughs> Well, and and it, it it's uh, it says there's there was some study that said that uh, uh, during during so during metamorphosis, I guess people think that the butterflies don't remember anything about being a caterpillar because their whole body rearranges in that chrysalis, right? Well, according to this, uh, it's challenging that, and it says that neural development. I guess their brain or how they function, how they how they work, uh, doesn't do doesn't completely do it. And so what what I'm going to do is I'm going to send this because yeah, I, send I, it to us. I'll send it to you. And if you want to post it or that's, look at it, I just pretty, thought it was that's pretty amazing. It is. So I'm going to send it to you right now. Um, anyway. Richard here is mentioning that he's got a Dutchman's pipe. Uh, going up a pine tree with no cats. So is uh, Richard is, and you can unmute yourself if you like, but is this the native Dutchman's pipe? Do you know if it's a native species or is one of the um, ornamental cultivars? Because that might have something to do with it. We, we planted uh, um, Clara Mullins. She's our, um, uh, she's a master gardener volunteer and she's kind of the leader for bed four, which is mostly a pollinator garden. And so we did plant you know, a lot there for hummingbirds, for caterpillars, uh, butterflies. And we did plant the native uh, Dutchman's pipe. And uh, it finally did, I think it's the second year maybe or third year we've had it there. And it finally did put on some flowers and fruits. I don't remember if I saw, did we see caterpillars? Did you see caterpillars on it, Clara? Yeah, I had, uh, I noticed, took a couple of pictures of the eggs and also the caterpillars. Uh, I have uh, the Aristolochia tomentosa in my front yard, and it's not a very large plant, so I can see everything. And I get the caterpillars on it, but they disappear before they're really fully grown. So I think the chameleons, the little, the green anoles, uh, are probably snacking, or the birds are somebody, because mm -hmm. I have yet to see them really mature. And I'm still waiting. I have one pod fruit pod or a seed pod that i'm waiting to figure out when is the best time for me to uh save it so that i can grow some so uh mary any idea um so this isn't richard this is stephanie richard is her husband uh stephanie wants to know do you think could it be the pine trees like the the pheromones you know the chemical compounds of the pine trees influencing you know or kind of uh, masking the, you know, that's maybe the butterflies can't find the Dutchman's pipe because it's near the pine tree. What do you think about that, Mary? I, I think it's probably some kind of predator 
that's that's getting them mm. that's what i would think <laughs> yeah i think they would uh you know there are native dutchman's pipes and you know pine trees are native so i'm sure the the butterflies have probably they've they probably have a, a discriminating palette to be able to to be able to find the right one yeah. Um, well, I will mention that uh, for those folks near Tallahassee, in uh, we'll, we'll, won't know what happens this year, I guess, quite yet. I imagine it probably will be canceled. But uh, when COVID isn't going on, the St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge has the uh, annual Monarch Butterfly Festival at their at their location, which is in St. Mark's, Florida, off Highway 98. And it is amazing. Um, the butterfly, the monarch butterflies, you know, kind of all gather up there, and it's amazing. Just the number of monarch butterflies down on the coast there is really impressive. And there's all sorts of cool events that they do. I think you can help tag some of the monarchs, um, and then you can just you know learn a lot about butterflies. So, and Mary, maybe that uh, your master gardener volunteers and uh, folks over that way that'd be a fun field trip. I don't know what's going to happen in 2020, but uh, you know, maybe next year. Yeah, and we have taken several field trips and gone over there <clears throat> to uh, St. Mark's, and um, I've worked with um, with them on. You know, they've given me seed, and uh, Scott Davis over there, who is the king of milkweed, yeah. has given me seed and protocols and such like that for for growing. Um, but yeah, they have a fabulous facility and um, they do so much good stuff. Do yeah, you know if he's, if he's still there? He was talking about going to be, become a lawyer so he could fight <laughs> some of the really? people who are, you know, if he's still there? Uh, I think he is still there. Yes, Donna was on one of those field trips. She and her husband uh, went on one of those. As far as I know, he's still there. I don't know if Rachel's uh, had any communication with him lately, but as far as I know, he is. Yeah, as far as I know. One thing I'll mention, um, you know, Jean kind of touched on this earlier, how having multiple um, butterfly gardens is really helpful, but even multiple butterfly gardens in your neighborhood is really great. So once you start gardening, you know, I garden in my front yard and I get to, you know, meet my neighbors, you know, now we can be socially distant, but we can share our, uh, especially our butterfly plants. So I can provide some nectar at my house, but then as the butterflies migrate through our neighborhood, they can also get some food um, and uh, even some larval host plants as well. Gaytree's got to leave. So bye Gaytree. Thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, thinking of that's great, Rachel. Thinking of it as uh, as resi those residential yards, as little um, islands of butterfly gardens to kind of help help them be able to find their way around and you know get as many resources as possible, help them out. Mm -hmm. uh, the, one of the shrubs at St. Mark's that I noticed the monarchs really love that would probably handle the shade as well is the saltbush or baccarus. It's a native shrub. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I do have it popping up in my own yard, um, and so I kind of let it go, and um, that could be another one. And it's the great thing, like Mary mentioned, it's got the bloom, uh, it blooms in the winter time, so uh, there's not much else going on at that time, so it's really um, helpful for nectar for the butterflies. And Glenna is asking Mary, are, butterf plant, are butterfly plants also good for the bees? Absolutely. And I know we were talking mostly about butterfly gardens, but um, the, the bees also like those, those same plants. So, uh, so yes, you could really expand it to be more of a pollinator garden. Yeah, and and keep in mind too that, that um, wasps also will um, you know, go after nectar and pollen um, in, on your plants. So, um, you know, be, you know, be tolerant of them as well. They get a bad rap. I did. They can be I, did, very I did just take out another wasp nest this morning in the vegetable garden. You know, we've had a couple of volunteers get, uh, get stung. But yes, usually we try to leave them alone when we can, right? 
Because they're, they're great predator species too. They can take out some of our pest species as well. We just don't want them on our pepper plants, right, Rachel? Yeah, or stinging our hands like I got. <laughs> um, any other questions, folks? We got about, you know, 10 more minutes here. Uh, ask away. Unmute yourself, go ahead. Uh, and it can be about anything else landscape related. Glenn is yeah. saying how she, she re realized that a lot of her vegetables she thinks are being pollinated by the wasps. Yeah, wasps yes. uh, move around and visit a lot of our flowers. And those stinking moths, you know, we usually complain about our, our the caterpillars that are eating some of our vegetables. Uh, those are usually moth caterpillars, but moths are pollinating those vegetables at once they, you know, move from that caterpillar to adult stage. So, you know, we got to, it takes all types. We got to, we got to be uh, tolerant of them all. Did I understand you say that saltbush is a host plant for caterpillars or butterflies? I think it's a ne I think it's more Can nectar. I don't know if it's a nectar? host. Plant, yes, it's nectar. nectar. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, at okay. St. Mark's, that saltbush on the coast, I yeah. mean, it will be just loaded um, with, you know, three, four dozen monarchs on the, the blooms. Um, so yeah, it's a really good one. And I think partly because like Mary said, it's, uh, it's blooming at its time of the season when there's a, you know, not as many options for them to get nectar. I've got one, but I've never really noticed butterflies on it. Those are, um, those are dioecious, right? So there's a male and a female version. Female, so yes. If you have the male version, it won't help much, but, uh, um, at one point I had both, but I don't know what I have now. <laughs> uh, let's see, what do we got here? Paul Horn is sharing something. Oh, a butterfly expert. Oh, that sounds kind of interesting. A, I think it's just for AARP members. Yeah, Paul, I'm not, I'm not eligible, buddy. Uh, <laughs> Movies for grown-ups, maybe uh, middle-aged people would like it just as much. Anyway, uh, The Dark Divide. So check that out, all of you are interested. And if you're an AARP member, I guess, AARP. Mm -hmm. My mom was kind of, uh, you know, she, I guess she got, got something in the mail uh, when she turns at whatever age, 60 or something or other. And, you know, she knew that that was, um, that was the first sign. <laughs> Yeah, I've thrown away all that course. <laughs> RP. I just do not want to acknowledge it. <laughs> You're just <ignoring laughs> <I'm eligible. laughs> uh, Anyone else want to unmute and uh, ask away? Anything garden related? Anyone have sod webworms? Yeah, it's a, a larval host plant, right? It, it is a larval host plant for a moth species, yes. Yeah, anyone. Anybody has sod <laughs> webworms. Yeah, they're eating up my, I, I sent Rachel and Molly, uh, another coworker of ours, uh, a picture because I was so excited because, you know, everyone comes to me with their sod webworm problems, but now I finally have sod webworms in my own grass. So I took pictures and I got some really good ones of the caterpillars and I was so excited. The destruction <laughs> is exponential. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing how much they can eat, yeah. It's like a foot, you call the spray people to come out and fix it, because I won't spray. And it's like 10 feet the next day. It's just like before they can get there, you're underwater. Yeah, yeah I just kind of let so, it eat, yeah. So what are you doing about yours, Mark? Not nothing. No, I'm just letting them eat away. I mean, the, the worst spot is in the backyard, which I don't really care about. You know, it's the, the front yard, there's one little small spot where they're there and it's not that bad, so I'm just leaving them alone. I'm just gonna watch the birds come in and you know eat them. Hopefully, yes. Hopefully, hopefully they will do that. You know, help okay. out our songbirds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the chi I was thinking I do have chickens, Glenn, and I think they would like the webworms, but uh, I won't have any grass left then. Uh, it'll all be gone. These chickens are are 4-H chickens. Uh, they retired to Mark's house and. Let's just say they got a little pampered by, you know, the volunteers and the kids there. So they know, they know their way around to eating a, a caterpillar. They had uh, army worms this spring uh, and all sorts of stuff. 
They, they are happy chickens so far. Uh, how to restore a lawn, Margaret, after sod webworm damage. So the one thing to remember with sod webworms is that uh, they're not necessarily fatal to your lawn, right? They're going to chew down the foliage, um, but typically they're, gonna, they're not going to eat the, the stems, the roots, the whole nine yards. And so, um, you know, the grass, once the webworms are done with their cycle, uh, there's a good chance that the grass will come back um, from the roots. Now we're getting kind of late and close to a while. It's going dormant as well. So, um, you know, even if they, they ate it so bad and you thought you need to like take it all out and do it again, uh, this probably wouldn't be the best time anyway, because we're getting close to the fall. Um, fertilize, definitely don't fertilize because that's actually going to encourage more wedworm damage because that's going to, you're going to have new leaf tissue. It's going to be nice and full of protein and nitrogen. It's going to be very tender and they're just going to, you're just going to encourage them to want to eat some more. So um, I would kind of, you know, kind of let it go and monitor it for a while. And then again, because we're getting towards the time of the year where, you know, it may not be ideal to uh, kind of lay sod or put out seed. Um, just kind of, it's all going to go brown soon anyway, when we get cold weather, right? Cause it's going to get really cold this winter. Um, and, uh, just let it be dormant and see what happens in the springtime. And I agree with you, Mark. And, and also, you know, we're always going to have some kind of pests come in. And so the, the best thing is that year round you, um, you have really good cultural practices um, in caring for your lawn, cutting it at the right height, fertilizing it appropriately, um, not overwatering, um, doing all those things uh, correctly. And then when you have the stress of those sod webworms come along, it's able to handle it and, and recover. Just like the host plants that recover from getting eaten up um, and they, they bounce back. Um, once they're gone, you know, the, the Turk should as well. Yeah, we're setting them up to be resilient, right? That's the new buzzword. Too. Yes, resilient. resilient. So we want resilient grass so that it can bounce back from these uh, stressors. Now my neighbor, he does not like them. And it's like, you know, all out nuclear war across the street. So uh, sod webworms don't have a chance over there, I don't think. But um, you know, all the birds, you know, we have bluebirds and whatnot. They can all come and hang out in my yard and, and munch away. Yes, well, and consider, uh, depending on what you would treat them with, um, you, you might kill the sod webworms, but you could kill other things as well, like um, ground nesting bees and, you know, other kinds of, of beneficial uh, insects um, that, that could be in there. Yeah, tolerance goes a long way. Yes, it does. Well, uh, we're at 1156. Uh, we, do we have any closing questions? We want to thank um, Mary very much. Yay, Mary. So Mary, you know, just went through Hurricane Sally. She just had 10 feet of water come into her yard, and she's here to help you all. Uh, you know, successfully uh, grow some butterfly gardens. So we want to thank her very much. So yay, Mary, you got some claps on the screen. Thank you very much. And we all want you to go visit uh, the Milton Vivarium when it's ready. So maybe next year it'll be all ready for you to go visit. Um, and we just thank you very, very much, Mary. And we hope you all have a, have a great day. Yes, well, and thank you for inviting me on your program today, uh, Mark and Rachel. Uh, it's fun, and I love to talk plants, and, and, and it's good to virtually see you all. That's right. All right, well, thank you, Mary. Thank you, everyone, and all, everyone have a great rest of your, what's today? It's Wednesday, right? So everyone have a good rest of your Wednesday.